Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us in worship. We are glad that you are here as we are in now our second week of Advent and the wonderful season of preparation that it is. We hope that you have been joining us for our midweek services. We have one left before the Christmas season, so next Wednesday will be our last midweek service. We have the, the dinner beforehand, so at 5.30. Service starts at 6.30. And we also have some devotional booklets for the entire season. So that covers the 40 days of Advent and, or 30 days, I don't even know how many days Advent is. But we have those in the back for you on the portals of prayer table. Please take one of those home and you can have uh, the, a chance to do devotions all season long as we are preparing and awaiting the coming Christ. Today is the last day for our We Care fundraiser. So if you haven't looked at the online auction yet, please do that today. We're so close to our goal. I think we're at 80% or so as of yesterday. So please check out those items and donate if you've been waiting for the very end. We also have gotten our poinsettias and adorned the altar, but we're still looking for donations. If you would like to help offset the cost of those, the 15th, so next Friday is the last day to get those donations in, especially if you're giving a memorial to anyone, um, writing their names, and those will be in the bulletin for Christmas Eve to give thanks to everyone who has done that. Coming up next weekend, we have a couple events going on. Starting on the 16th, our jump group is going to be doing their progressive dinner. And so they will meet in the fellowship hall at 4 o'clock next Saturday on the 16th. And they're also going to be doing a Yankee Swap gift exchange. So if you're planning to join them for that, make sure you bring one to share. Then the next day on the 17th, our, we're going to have another milestone for our six and seven-year-olds talking about the difference between happiness and joy and how God highlights joy over and above happiness. So we invite you to join us for that. And then later that evening, our men's group and joy group are going to be going caroling. So they're going to visit the care center and a couple of our shut-in members, and we invite you to be a part of that. We do have to limit that to only 20 people because of some of the space concerns. So sign up early. I don't want to say sign up often, but sign up early so that you can get and be a part of that. The song sheets will be provided and then they're going to meet back here for chili and some desserts afterwards. Then the next day, our men's group is going to have their regular monthly meeting. That will be on the 18th at seven o'clock. They're going to be continuing talking about uh, the Reformation and kind of what that spurred in the area, the culture after that. So they're using the thing, a man named Martin, the movement. And we invite you to join them as they continue that. Because of our Christmas holiday, that's going to interfere with their plans for their men's breakfast and activity again. So those two items are canceled for this month. But please join them for the men's group. Next week, not next week, two weeks, uh, starting the 18th, Pastor Nick is going to be on vacation. So he's going to go and visit some family and stuff starting the 18th to the 22nd, I believe. And so he will not be in the office, but Leslie and I will still be here. And if you have any questions, you can let us know about that. Thank you to everyone who signed up for that prayer team that we've been looking for. We had quite a list of names. We are going to send those emails out starting next week. So if you've been waiting, please let us know you would like to join that email list and we'll be sure to get your name on it so that we can send those prayer emails to you probably about once a week, I think is what we're looking at right now. So let the office know if you would like to receive those emails. And the last announcement I have for you this morning is kind of what we're gonna do in our service today. We are celebrating the Lord's Supper and since we don't have the railings up here, we are gonna do it in the continuous flow style. So our usher will dismiss you when it's time. And we're going to do one whole side by one whole side. So just please be aware of that as we proceed with communion this morning. Those are all the announcements I have. So John is going to ring the bells for us. Dorothy will introduce our first hymn, and we will all stand to sing.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait Wait for the Lord. Be strong, and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. And in his word, I hope. We will now light two of our candles on our Advent wreath. With hope in the Lord's promises of renewal by his word and spirit, let us together confess our sins to him. Out of the depths I cry to you, Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my pleas for mercy. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, I would have no hope. But with you there is forgiveness. Therefore, we place our trust in you. Restore us, Lord God and set us free from our sins. Renew us in your hope that we may wait for your salvation. Because of your steadfast love for us in Christ, redeem us from all our iniquities. Amen. As we wait for Jesus' final coming, we place our hope and our confidence in the promises of his word and find our home in the presence of his spirit, confessing our sins and turning away from them through lives of repentance We are assured again this day of the Lord's steadfast love and plentiful redemption for us. As a called and ordained servant of the word and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Congregation may be seated, and our adoration handbells will now play a song for us. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Stir up our hearts, O Lord, to make ready the way of your only begotten Son, that by his coming we may rejoice in our eternal home. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Old Testament reading is from Isaiah chapter 40. 
Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries, In the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, Cry, and I said, What shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all its beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows on it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Go on up to a high mountain, O Zion. Herald of good news, lift up your voice with strength. O Jerusalem, herald of good news, lift it up, fear not. Say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. Behold, the Lord God comes with might and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. This is the word of the Lord. And our epistle reading is from 2 Peter chapter 3. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness? waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. This is the word of the Lord. And at this time, please stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel is according to St. Mark, the first chapter. The beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. This is the gospel of the Lord. The congregation may be seated, and we invite the kids to come forward for a children's message. Welcome, welcome. Come on forward. We're glad that you're here. I don't know why, but it feels like each week there's more children that come up here. And there is lots of blue. Yeah, it's a sea of blue. It's a season of blue this year also, or this season, I should say, this time of the year. So I have to ask you, are you ready? You don't even know what I'm asking about. But you're ready? You all got it covered? So like if I were going to say, are you ready to take the math test at the end of church today? You guys are all set? (laughs) Some of you. What about history tests? You're going to be good? No, (laughs) so you're like, no, not history. Like German, if I hit a German test at the end of the worship? (laughs) Stacey, a little bit, (laughs) a little bit. I know. What about a Japanese test? No, yeah, a little bit. (laughs) Yeah. 
So you could be ready for all sorts of things, right? But the real question for today and for the season of Advent is, are you ready for Christmas? Yes. Yes? Okay, so what do you do to prepare or to get ready for Christmas? James? Put up a tree. Okay, who got their tree up? Okay, good. You're prepared so far. Fantastic. What else? Yes, sir. You get presents ready? <laughs> no, so you're not ready. I see. Put ornaments on the tree. You put ornaments on the tree already. Okay, great. You're ready. Izzy, how about you? Christmas lights on the tree. You put Christmas lights up. Okay, great. Whose dad put Christmas lights up? You didn't have Yeah. <laughs> what else do you do to get ready? Henry. Wrap presents. Okay, who wrapped some presents? Okay, who still has presents to wrap? Me too, yeah. All right, what else? Let's do one more. What else do you do to prepare or get ready for Christmas? Yes, sir. Make cookies with Grandma. Okay, who made cookies? Who is going to eat the cookies? Yeah. Right. All right, put your hands down. Thank you. There are lots of things that we can do to get ready or to prepare for Christmas because Christmas is an important time. Christmas is the time when Jesus came into the world to save us from our sins. And in our gospel reading for today, there is someone, and our Old Testament reading, someone who comes to prepare the way, prepare the way for Jesus to come at Christmas. But their kind of preparation is a little different. The man's name was John the Baptist. He was related to Jesus, and he said to prepare the way of the Lord. But according to John... What do you have to do to prepare for Jesus' coming? Does anybody know? Yes, sir. Be baptized? Not yet. That's kind of a part of it. But there is a, something that comes first. Any ideas? You guys aren't prepared at all, it sounds like. If you don't know what you need to be prepared for, for when Jesus comes at Christmas... And so Isaac had kind of the second part. He said to be baptized. That's part two. Okay, but before you're baptized, there is part one, which is what? Sin? No, we already do that. We don't have to prepare for that. That's kind of easy. James? No, that's not. I mean, it's kind of important, but that's not the preparation they're talking about. This kind of preparation is to repent. Who knows what that means? Who knows what repent means? Does someone want to tell us? Amy? Amy? Yep, so repentance is you say sorry for your sins, and then you turn and go the other direction, right? It means you're not going to do those sins anymore. You feel bad about them, you feel guilt and shame about them, and so you confess them to God, and you try to live better. And then when you're baptized, God washes your sins away. It gives you this new life to help you live the way you want to, and that's what John is talking about, the way to be prepared. Being prepared for Jesus is seeing that you do things that are not right. Who has done a sin ever in their life before? Look at all those parents lying. (laughs) They're not lying. They just never think they're participating, but they always are. You can put your hands down. That's right. All of us have sinned, and all of us need to repent. And we did that already in worship today. The part of the service that Pastor Nick talked about was confession or repentance and then absolution, receiving God's forgiveness. That's the whole reason that Jesus came. He came to forgive us from our sins and give us this new life. And so because we're still getting ready for Christmas, we're still preparing for Christmas, we are going to say our prayer today and we are going to repent of our sins and ask God to help us be ready. So you fold your hands with me today and repeat after me as we pray. We say, Dear Jesus, I have sinned and I am sorry for my sins. Turn me away from sin and towards you and prepare me for your coming at Christmas. Because you are the greatest gift 
we will ever receive. Thank you, Jesus, for preparing me. In your name we pray. And all the people say, Amen! All right, thank you so much. Now go ask everybody who's sitting down to stand up so that we can confess our faith together using the words of the Nicene Creed. And if you haven't already been asked, please stand and confess with us. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We continue to, with singing our sermon hymn, Entrust Your Days and Burdens, verses 1 through 4 and 6. You may be seated.
and grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Father, and Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You would think that I'm going to talk about preparation today for the sermon, but I already did that, so we're going to focus on a different one of God's readings, and it's connected to what Pastor Nick said on Wednesday. On Wednesday, his sermon and one of the kind of themes for the weeks of Advent is a sermon about peace and how God brings peace, and, and peace is an essential kind of picture of what the Advent season is awaiting and looking forward to. But I think if you have looked around at what's happening in the world at all, you realize that peace is kind of a difficult thing to find right now. You have the, the ongoing war in Russia and Ukraine and the fighting that they are doing. You have the recent conflict between uh, Israel and Palestine and, and the difficulties that they have. And not to mention, you know, actual war, but just conflict in general with um, political divisions and people on either side of the aisle fighting and, and criticizing and trying to attack one another. And that's not even adding into it all of the family troubles that just somehow come up during holiday seasons and bring this large experience of conflict to many people. Peace is not an easy thing for us to experience or understand. And we see that happening not only in our world today, but in our scriptures, in the history of God's people, Israel. Israel was preparing to face a time of unrest and, and strife and difficulty in our Old Testament reading from today. Our Old Testament reading for today is from Isaiah chapter 40, but in chapter 39, the king of Israel does something that many of us would describe as being really, really dumb. And in chapter 39, the king of Israel invites the Lord of another nation to come into Israel and see all of the wealth and riches present in Israel. That's all that he shows him. He welcomes him into the, the palace and into the temple and sees, well, see, we have the, all this gold over here. There's these silver things over here, this great wealth that God's people had. And the prophet Isaiah talks to the king and he says, okay, you know, king, I think Hezekiah is the name, but I could be wrong, says, okay, well, what did you show the people from Babylon? And, Isaiah, or, and Hezekiah says, well, I showed them all the wealth of Israel. I showed them everything. There was nothing that was hidden from them. And Isaiah says, okay, well, that means they are going to come back and destroy Israel. That, and that's exactly what happens. Isaiah prophesies that the kingdom of Babylon is going to come in to Israel and conquer the nation of Israel. And not only that, he's going to send them into exile out of their, their homeland, out of the place that God had promised to them. And so this prophecy of Isaiah is one primarily of doom and gloom. They are going to come in and destroy you and remove you from your kingdom. Because of your sin, because of your constant rebellion of God, this nation is going to come in and take everything that you have. If we look back, verses 6 through 8 of chapter 39, it says, Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and that which your fathers have stored up till this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord. And some of your own sons who will come from you, whom, will be, whom you will father, shall be taken away, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Then Hezekiah said to Isaiah, The word of the Lord is good that you have spoken. The word of the Lord that you have spoken is good, for he thought there will be peace and security in my days. Isaiah is prophesying this time of destruction, but all the king can think of is his own safety because it's not going to happen yet. I don't have to worry about it right now. This is for all the generations that are coming after me, all the descendants, all the following nations of Israel. They're the ones who are going to have to worry about this. And this hasn't 
been a new problem for Israel. They've had centuries, a history of conflict and fighting with the nations around them because they never listen to what God tells them to do. God says, drive out the Canaanites. The Israelites are like, yeah, we'll drive out the Canaanites, except for those people. We're going to leave those, and they're going to be fine, and then we'll drive out the rest. And their disobedience to God leads to constant problems in their future, to the point where they are right now. They're worn down. They're depressed. And while the king might not be, everyone else certainly is, because they know what's coming. And what's maybe worse for them is they don't know when it's coming. They know that Babylon is going to come into their nation, destroy their wealth and security, and drive them into exile. And so they sit in this station of apprehension and fear. But God doesn't leave them in that state. In our, our, God, our Old Testament reading for today, Isaiah prophesies words of help. Chapter 40, verse 1, Isaiah says, Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. These are words of comfort for God's people because they see, he sees the situation they're in. He sees the difficulty that they are facing. And this kind of linguistic trick in the Bible is this double comfort. You see this double comfort. When you see this repeated or a word repeated in Scripture, it, it has a, an extra special emphasis. And in this instance, it's talking about this double comfort because of this sense of urgency that it's creating. And there are two parts to this. The first comfort is kind of addressing Israel's great need. They have a great need for comfort, a need for help and reprieve and, and provision. But then the second aspect coming into this is God's great desire to provide this for his people. I think you're all very well aware that, the that with sin comes consequences. And this happening to God's people is the result of their sin, the result of the ways that they have rebelled against God, bringing difficulty and pain. But even though consequences come, God still desires to provide for the needs of his people. And so he says, comfort, comfort. And this comfort isn't solely coming just because of the need of God's people, but instead it's coming out of God's desire, his longing to provide comfort for his people. Just because the people want it, doesn't mean that they deserve it or should get it, but it's coming to them because God so greatly and strongly desires to give it to them. God wants to provide this great comfort to them. And as we talk about this, and I was, I was reading through this today, I had, or today and, and, well, throughout this week, I had to say, okay, Isaiah is prophesying these words, but who exactly is he speaking to? Because you could very easily say, well, he's speaking to Israel. He goes and prophesies to the nation in his day and time. That's pretty clear. But I push back and say, is it only? Are these words of comfort only for the nation of Israel during this difficult time? And the answer is no. Because of what comes after these words. You have this words of comfort and peace, but then you also have words of prophecy that Isaiah speaks next. These words of comfort come as a result of something. Verse 2 says, Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended and her iniquity is pardoned. That she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. These are words of comfort and peace to God's people in Israel when it was spoken, but also to us today. Because these words of comfort come from a very specific source, which we read about in verses 3 through 5. 
Verse 3 says, A voice cries in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. These words of comfort are not coming to us, to God's people, because of the deliverance from exile and the difficulties that they face right then. These words of comfort come to God's people, all of God's people from the times of Isaiah now today because of and through Jesus Christ. Those words of prophecy in Isaiah prophesy to the incarnation of Christ, God himself stepping into human flesh for the sole purpose of saving God's people from their sins. It's pointing to that moment that we are preparing for, that we are getting excited for, where Christ comes into this world to save us. It's what Isaiah points to and what we see fulfilled in our gospel reading from Mark today. John the Baptist comes to prepare the way, prepare for something greater even than these people could imagine, because they're imagining it as this deliverance from difficulty, this different, or deliverance from captivity or rule, political rule. But Christ comes to bring about deliverance from sin. Deliverance from death and from the power of Satan. He comes to bring comfort to all. But we have trouble hearing that. We hear these words of comfort, comfort, And we think, yeah, well, that would be nice, Jesus, or that would be nice, Isaiah, but where is it? I have this difficult situation that I'm going through. I have this medical trouble that I need. I have financial difficulties. I have pain. I have, I just to be frank, God, I have sin in my life that I don't think you can handle. Where is your comfort for someone like me? Where is your comfort in this season of joy and and celebration? Because I don't feel it. How can you bring comfort in those moments? And it is exactly this concern that Isaiah is speaking these words to address. Because this comfort, comfort is for all of God's people at all times. We see in verse 9 that this is something that is intended to be proclaimed to all the people. It says, Go up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Lift your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good news. Lift it up, fear not. Say to the cities of Judah, Behold your God. These words of comfort are for the people of Israel in this situation of Isaiah, but they're also for you today. God is proclaiming to you his comfort, double comfort because of your need, but more especially because of his desire to provide that comfort for you. And there are reasons that we can be sure that God's comfort is something that we can trust in. Isaiah keeps going in chapter 40, verse 10. It says, behold, the Lord God comes with might and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. The first reason that you can trust that God will bring you comfort is because God is able to do so. With this power, this might that we cannot understand to provide the things that we don't think or we can't figure out how will come to be. God is able to provide this comfort to you. Even though you might seek it in other places, you might look to friends or or stuff or podcasts or wherever you go to to find that comfort, you are missing out on the ones who can truly provide comfort to you, your Lord and God. Because not only is God able to provide this comfort to you, but God gently provides this comfort to you. 
In the next passage, verse 11, he will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. God, in his power and majesty, is able to provide comfort to us, but he does so in a way that actually provides comfort, that actually provides help and hope for the future. And we see that on no better display than the incarnation of Jesus Christ into the world. Because the greatest need of all humanity is the sin in our lives. We need to be freed from that sin, from our slavery to sin, from the pain that it causes and the difficulty that it creates in the world around us. And God, because he desires to do so, because he is able to do so, did exactly that. He sent his son into the world to deliver you from sin and to bring you comfort in difficulty. And he does so as you turn to him. It's not that God withholds it from you when you don't. It's that you don't realize how much comfort God provides to you when you turn to other things for it. God's comfort is always before you because he is always longing to give it to you. And when you turn to him and see how he provides for you, that comfort is fully and doubly yours. It's comfort that I know you need today because you need it just as much as I do. But it's also comfort that is freely given you today and will be even greatly, more great, more greatly is not a way to say it, but even more to be celebrated in the days to come because we are indeed being prepared. Prepared for the coming of God. The coming of our Lord Jesus Christ into this world to save us from all sins. So hear again the words of the Lord. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins, that you have received comfort through Christ our Lord. In his name, amen. And at this time, we're going to bring our offerings forward. And if you haven't done so already, please sign the friendship registers in the pews before you and let us know of any prayer requests that you might have. Would you all now please stand for prayer? As we wait in love for the coming of our Lord, let us together as his Advent people bring our prayers before him. We're going to lift up today uh, all those who are being treated for cancer and who reside in care centers, but also uh, Luann Gotch's cousin and her family, cousin Amy Russell and her family, um, after her uh, husband, John, died on Thursday after a battle with cancer, so lifting them up. We're also going to pray continued prayers of healing uh, for Jan as she's recovering from pneumonia still. Glad that she is here with us today, but for continued strength and healing. But also prayers of thanks for uh, Kathy Tortson, who is also recovering and doing well at this time. Father in heaven, you prepare, prepare a heavenly home for all who trust in you and come into your presence through faith in your Son. 
by his coming into this world to save us from the devastation of our sins, dying and rising again to make us eternally yours. We have been reconciled to you. We praise you, Father, for this amazing gift of love and ask that your Holy Spirit keep your steadfast love secure in our hearts throughout the days of our waiting. Come, Lord Jesus, our gracious King. Knowing that you have come once into this world, Lord Jesus, we are confident that you will come again. On that glorious day when we are all gathered before you, when every knee will bow to you and every tongue confess your holy name, we will receive the restoration of all things in heaven and on earth that your word has promised. Until your final coming, O Lord, keep us secure in our salvation. Remind us that our waiting is because of your patience and that you call us to use this time we have been given to share your precious gospel with the world you died and rose again to save. Stir up the hearts of all who hear your word this day, that many will come to saving faith and experience the comfort of your presence in their lives. Come, Lord Jesus, our gracious King. As wanderers in this land, O Lord, we experience various types of brokenness and pain, suffering and grief. We lift before you in prayer those we love who are also loved by you. For those longing for food and shelter, grant your mercy. For those needing protection and peace, grant your spirit. We pray for those in our families and connected to our family of faith who have special concerns of body and spirit. Especially Lyndon Luke, Lisa Youngers, Liam Kiefer, Stephanie Wellicht, and Naomi Wagon connect as they are being treated for cancer. We also lift up Arlene Hankin, John and Bertha Maloney, Ardell Debo, Gary Boyum, and Don Ellinghuizen as they reside in care centers. Provide your comfort and peace to them. We ask that that great comfort which you desire to give us, Lord, be with Amy Russell and her family and friends after the death of her husband. Lord God, surround them with members of your community to bring your peace and presence into their lives during this difficult time. We give you thanks for the healing work you have done in Jan and pray that you would continue to do so, bringing her back to full strength and health and praising your name for what you have, the healing you have brought to Kathy as well. Lord God, we thank you for all the work of healing and help that you are giving to us now and always. Grant that all who wander find their home in you alone, O Lord. Come, Lord Jesus, our gracious King. Comforting Spirit, fill our land, our homes, our workplaces, our schools, and all our interactions with others with your blessings. Allow this season of waiting and preparation to refocus our hearts and minds upon your mission for our congregation and for us as individual members of this household of faith. Bless our We Care program as we search for the staff for our planned expansion. Direct us to those who will best serve our community and congregation through their work with the families who join us. Stir up our hearts to make known to all the wonders you have done so that more souls may be brought to saving faith and many would join us in saying, Come, Lord Jesus, our gracious King. Confident in our coming King and Savior, we entrust our prayers into the good and gracious hands of our sovereign God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who lives and reigns both now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord. Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, whose way John the Baptist prepared, proclaiming him the promised Messiah, the very Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, and calling sinners to repentance, that they might experience a joyful homecoming when he comes again in glory. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying,
Our Lord Jesus Christ, the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. And in the same way also, he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of all your sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth, for you have patiently shown mercy to us and given your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. We thank you for the homecoming you promised to come to you through faith in Jesus Christ. Send to us your comforting spirit as we joyfully remember our Redeemer and receive him who comes to us in his body and blood. Lord, remember us in your kingdom as we take refuge in you and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Would you now please be seated?
Would you all now please stand? And now may this body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you steadfast in the true faith to life everlasting. Depart in his peace. Amen. And let us pray. O God, the Father, the fountain and source of all goodness, who in, loving, who in steadfast love sent your only begotten Son into this world of sin, we thank you that for his sake you look upon us without spot or blemish and at peace. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. We now sing our closing hymn.
And thank you for joining us in worship this morning. Sunday School and Bible class started two minutes ago. So go in peace and serve the Lord.